Welcome, uh, Michael Prelutsky. He is the president, CEO of Jersey City Medical Center and the RWJ Barnabas Health System, and he is immediately to the north of our site, and we're very excited to have him here. Let's see, Anthony Montalto, I never used the last name, but Anthony is one of the leading engineers in the city, a uh, partner at JB&B, and is an expert on building technology and systems as well as another great engineer in the city, Honorius Vadian. Uh, ah, okay, he's on the end, sorry. He is uh, Senior Vice President and Director of Information Technology is at Cosentini Tetratech. And I actually am welcoming Stefan Knust. He is a guest star today, not in the program, but he is head of our sustainability, uh, sustainability and I never leave home without him when I'm talking about sustainability. Uh, so uh, today he's here. So, um, you know, health and wellness and creating a live, work, play environment is really part of wellness. Uh, in short, wellness has become about sustaining the planet. So the term wellness has been around for a long time. Uh, I remember discussing it in relative to sort of uh, residential projects and then it merged into the office environment, but it never really had the meaning it does today, and it's now the umbrella that includes sustainable buildings, physical and mental health, equity, community engagement, one could say sustainability is about the environment of the building, but wellness is about the sustainability of the planet and mankind. So with that small statement, we'll start to talk about it. Um, Stefan, why don't you help me, again, uh, clarify myself <laughs> relative to sustainability and wellness and where we are with wellness when it comes to how you look at buildings. Yeah, no, it's, it's all interconnected, and I would add resilience to that, too. But if you look it up, uh, the term uh, wellness, uh, as defined by the Global Wellness Institute, defines it as the active pursuit of actions, choices, and lifestyles that lead to a state of holistic health. So the short version of that is wellness leads to well-being and happiness. And those three terms are something that our design industry is certainly familiar with. Um, but the pandemic has really driven home the fact that anything that we do uh, has to ha be thought of as a, as a health um, action. Um, and at multiple scales. And one thing that I like about that term is that it's certainly focused on the individual, and I think we all felt that over the past year and a half, how that does apply to us. But it also applies to our families, our communities, our institutions, our organizations. Um, and I think you can apply that, that framework, that operative framework, um, to, to anything that you're engaged with, with others. Um, one example uh, I'll give of how that is applied in our industry is through third-party verification. Um, it's one of the things I like to advocate in, in my work, whether I'm speaking to my colleagues or to clients or prospective clients. And uh, we decided to put ourselves through the process uh, when we moved into One World Trade right across the river. And together with Anthony's team, um, we uh, are going through the certification process for well certification. One interesting observation that I made is that as you read through the manual, um, there are over 800 individual decisions that you have to make about the application of wellness to your organization, and only half of them are design decisions. Uh, the rest are made up of policy decisions and amenity decisions, um, which sort of underscores the fact that wellness is an active state of being. It's not a passive state of being. It's not going to be our plaque on the wall. It's going to be our practice uh, together. I think the last thing I want to say to that point is that um, wellness is obviously a multi-trillion dollar industry, and there's a lot of innovation and research happening. Um, in urban planning at that scale, uh, in artificial intelligence, and in neuroscience. This is what's most exciting to me is because it brings everybody who's curious about life in general together in this environment to, I think, work on behalf of wellness, which to me is all about public health. That's great. Well, Michael, now that uh, I'd like to look to you to describe what the wellness of wellness is. New Jersey uh, Medical Center and Barnabas Health Community Wellness is really at the forefront of their own perspective. How have the conversations on wellness transformed the healthcare arena? And how is this going, I mean, in, if you can, how do you think this uh, conversation is gonna affect the work environment? So uh, I am grateful to be here. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, I am the president and CEO of the medical center, uh, just about a mile away. And by definition, certainly when we start talking hospitals, it sort of does not mean wellness, right? Uh, well people don't usually end up in a hospital. Uh, but it does highlight how the medical center at this point, as well as uh, 
RWJ Barnabas Health as a health system has changed uh, coming along with the industry and, uh, and projects uh, like Cove. Uh, we are looking at our job at this point as responsible for health, for the health of the communities where we're based. Uh, we are a not-for-profit enterprise, and so again, our mission has transformed over the last 20, 25 years uh, beyond the acute care episodes and trying to look and see how we influence health of the communities we serve. And uh, so that is a focus. Um, and uh, some of the aspects that we've known for a long time but truly have come to the forefront, and many folks have talked about them in the last two, three years especially. Um, and actually, I think there's a panel coming up next uh, that, let's say, social determinants of health. So where you live, where you work, what you had for lunch, how often you walk, is anywhere from 65 to 85 percent of your health. So if health is, to some degree, equals wellness, it's not really about seeing a doctor, about uh, being taken care of in a, uh, in a hospital that, that, that defines how healthy you are, how wellness uh, you are, if I can sort of uh, uh, transform the word. So we, again, as a large healthcare enterprise across the state, probably the largest one, 40 plus thousand people, uh, that's our goal, um, influencing the health of the communities we're based in. So just some basic examples, when one goes to our offices now, uh, we will ask, well beyond just your blood pressure and the medication, we will ask, okay, what do you have for lunch? How often do you walk? And how are you thinking about your wellness? The other thing that we've known for a long time, as sort of another example of this, is of course behavioral health, mental health, as it Im impacts wellness overall. Uh, so if we assume that uh, ending up in a hospital is bad, and ending up in a hospital back to back, let's say within 30 days, is really, really bad. One's mental health determines 60% of the time if one ends up back at the hospital within 30 days. So again, this behavioral health, mental health aspect of what we try to deliver to the community is a huge part of our focus on wellness. So foundationally, that's the changing of the industry, and I've been in this industry for 25 years. Uh, and we can talk about a lot of stuff that is fueling this, uh, but certainly money's part of it. Um, investing in acute care enterprise is very expensive, and treating patients in an acute a, a, a care enterprise only is very expensive. And we've heard uh, that we're nearing, what, 20% GDP as far as the health expenditures, and that's just not sustainable. Um, the companies truly can't afford that level of investment in the health of their employees. So here, too, we have a number of innovative partnerships with the employers, with the insurance carriers, because we can't influence the community health by ourselves. We're in it all together. Again, a bit of a wide-ranging answer here, but uh, that is our mission now. Wellness is where we are at going forward. Yeah, and it's a familiar idea to, under, to look to healthcare itself for it. But as we expand the conversation, how do we engage it and how, what demands are you, for instance, seeing out of buildings? For instance, Anthony, uh, let's dig a little deeper, deeper and think about the buildings themselves. Okay, with that as a background is one of your responsibilities to ensure the, the vehicle to. Uh, what is the wellness relative to healthy buildings? What are the forces of technical and en engineering innovations in the wellness for indoor environments, hospital environments, lab environments, schools? It's up to you. Right now we're focusing on the building. Later we'll fo focus on the community. Sure. So we spend most of our time indoors, and this past 20 months or so, we've really understood the importance of health and wellness, the air we're breathing when we're inside. And you know, it's a big factor when it comes to your well-being, not just your, your physical state, but your mental state, as Michael just talked about. So it's important we understand those aspects when we're looking at designing these new buildings moving forward. Um, unfortunately, in the past, health and wellness wasn't a primary driver in design aspects. It kind of was secondary almost. And just recently, we started to become more aware of health and wellness and the importance of it. Look back to 2016. Harvard did a tremendous amount of research in regards to indoor spaces and cognitive functions for humans inside those indoor spaces. And not surprisingly, the results of that study show that cognitive function decreased with a lot of airborne contaminants and the amount of CO2 levels within the space. Now, I want you to think back to last summer. We were all coming out of our you know, COVID states inside our houses. 
We still finished are. watching. Still are. Still are. <laughs> Except hospitals. Yes. Yeah. We, um, we finished watching uh, you know, Tiger King on Netflix. We finished baking all those breads at home. We finally came outdoors. We went inside other spaces. I know for me personally, and for many people I talk to, there's a sense of anxiety that was felt. And that sense of anxiety did create a different type of environment with inside myself, which affected me from a physical standpoint. So I think we, we should really look back at those experiences and learn from them. We need to understand the air quality within our spaces, where air is being distributed within a space, how it's being returned. Is there a filter on that air conditioning unit? When I enter a space, is the doors open to get more outside air? What is my connection to the outdoors in terms of that sense of nature and that sense of well-being? So if all these aspects are going to be so integral to every design we look at in the future, whether it's a laboratory building, a healthcare facility, commercial office facility, it should be at the forefront of every design moving forward. Yeah, and I think we're looking forward to learning more about that, understanding more of that. Michael, I'm going to give you another chance that this is how hospital design is going, and it's probably going to be infiltrating almost every design program design out there now. Any comments on that? Or otherwise, we'll go to smart cities. It's... Uh... We do, um, prior panelists have talked about uh, this location uh, as accessible to the best workforce uh, around, and hospitals are no different. Uh, we have right. to compete with, uh, for the workforce. There are many articles uh, in all the papers about uh, lack of skilled uh, workforce, uh, especially around uh, uh, folks getting burned out with COVID, for example. So creating sustainable um, spaces in the hospital for our employees, actually foremost, mm -hmm. and engaging them and making sure that they're well especially, again, mentally, because they go through some tough times dealing, for, again, last year and a half has been very tough on them. That's a huge focus for us. And providing, again, the, we even created, for example, uh, decompression rooms um, in the hospital for the first time uh, during the pandemic to allow that to happen. And so for the stuff to be built into spaces to where we don't have to convert, uh, that truly really is going to be a great. And, and, and the interesting part of it, again, at the Cove will be a transformational model, but I think life science has always led the way, along with hospital design, in terms of really what is a healthy environment, what is a, the air changes are many times an hour, and you know, I think that that um, life science aspect of it will probably be a, a really in, interesting part of this development because it is mixed use. Um, Honorius, um, as we get in to the next piece, um, smart city technology, which I always call, when we talked earlier, it used to be the phone, and now you've got some ideas that it's beyond the phone, which <laughs> I'm just getting used to. But, um, you know, where, where are we with smart technology? How is that going to help us understand building technology, the comfort levels, the safety levels, but also the communication level? Thanks, Peter. So before I answer the question, you know, I just want to take just a moment to acknowledge the re our re resiliency going through all these um, unprecedented times that we went through. Uh, they created a lot of hardship for a lot of families across US and the globe. But I think there's a silver lining uh, in all this. And I think um, hardship uh, inspires innovation. And I think it kind of changed the way we look at uh, live, work, and play environments, which brings me back to the code. So I think we all embrace this um, experiment, working from home. And I think technology played a key role into all this. Uh, and uh, it proved that it works. Mm -hmm. And it can completely change the way we look at uh, the way we play, work, and live in a tight community. So coming back to your question, and um, in a sense of achieving the health and wellness goals uh, for the Cove, uh, there's a shift in the way we look at technology. And it's not a means to an end goal. Um, it's not a, a platform that will take you to where you need to get to. I think it, it becomes a central part of this, um, integral part of this ecosystem that we're trying to build. And what are we trying to build is, with the use of technology, we're trying to get access to, uh, to uh, uh, retail information. We're trying to get access to uh, emergency information. We're trying to get access to um, information, transport. Um, first, we're looking at uh, controlling the individual spaces that we are within the building, within our close quarters, uh, moving outside and controlling buildings. Uh, we do have the technology to do that. But as you mentioned, you know, placing the building into a neighborhood, 
um, and uh, uh, going beyond that, placing that into uh, the larger con context of a city. Um, cities have many uh, sm uh, smart uh, technologies built into, uh, so through the use of uh, the phone, but other platforms, you, you can have access to transportation information. So what other platforms, though? That's what I'm really curious about. I'm sorry? What other platforms other than the phone? Because that's the only well, thing I know. Uh, the, quite honestly, the, the, the phone, it is, it was the catalyst that everything started with the phone. Um, but wearables are becoming more and more um, the way to go, right? So we're trying to streamline the way we use and interact with the technology. Pressing buttons, it's not very efficient, so you're trying to, uh, to get to a different way to, uh, uh, to interact with that. Uh, and the way you deliver the information, it could be through, uh, still uh, through a screen, but uh, wearables and augmented reality and virtual reality becomes a streamline to do that. Now, I want to make a distinction between control and uh, automation, and I think this is where we're getting to. Uh, we've been controlling uh, our environments, and we've been controlling devices for quite some time right now. What we're trying to get to is automate everything. We don't want to initiate a change into our environment. We want the environment to change as we walk into our apartment. You know, I want to sense that it's me, and I like the temperature to be a certain um, level. The apartment should be able to, uh, or the space that I walk into should be able to, uh, to make that change. So that is getting us to the next level, which is creating predictive environments. We do have that information. We, we read data, we collect data, we put that data through, uh, through engines that make us understand uh, what the, that information means. So now we're ready to actually let our buildings and our spaces react to that and change based on our needs. So Michael, again putting you on the spot relative to the Cove, now that we have the idea that Liberty of Science incubators K through 12 and that whole learning environment there, sound body, sound, body, sound mind, sound uh, environment. You're at the bookend to that now and you have all of this to play with and you have all of this to draw upon as part of your wellness programs. Do you see any um, sort of synergies there now between the Cove, Liberty Science, and yourself and what to the community? So I think that the Cove is another example of uh, really what's happening in Jersey City in Hudson County. And uh, the prior panelists have talked about the rising tide lifting all boats. Um, so Jersey City Medical Center, just being part of the large health system that's willing to invest in Hudson County, again, looking at what's happening here, um, is probably spending about $160 million and more to come in the next year and a half to two years to improve our infrastructure, to build out more facilities, to hire more uh, staff, more skilled staff. And so as we recruit really um, high-end physicians, high-end nurses and pharmacists and all the skilled labor, even now we employ 2,500 people and that's growing. So again, recruiting all those folks into this neighborhood with Cove coming up and other uh, things coming up in Jersey City and in Hudson County, frankly, it just makes it easier for us to grow, to get better and to serve this community better as the community grows itself. Um, the other aspect of it beyond just the uh, uh, economic um, engine, which again, uh, Jersey City Medical Center by itself is about a $420 million footprint now on this community, and uh, about 90 million of that is sort of community impact as measured by, um, by the state. Um, so, but beyond that, we are also learning, uh, evolving academic institutions. So, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health is in a very tight partnership with Rutgers and Rutgers Health. We are connected to the two medical schools. We're connected uh, with the Cancer Institute of New Jersey, for example. It probably has more clinical trials in the tri-state to include some uh, uh, large places across the river than anybody else. So this connection um, with, again, the kind of physicians, scientists that we're recruiting, uh, as well as the resources of Rutgers Medical, uh, really will drive uh, the collaborations that we think uh, uh, are forthcoming in Hudson County and in Jersey City. And it's really not a hypothetical. Already we're working uh, with, uh, with Stevens Institute, for example, in Hoboken. We're uh, working uh, with St. Peter's. We're working with uh, uh, other institutions here in Jersey City. So certainly whatever happens here at Cove uh, will be available. We'll be right there to support it. Um, an example, a recent example, and we always go to examples that uh, 
that make an impact. Um, one of the ways the whole COVID thing turned uh, for hospitals, and as you read um, in March or so of last year, uh, it was very, very difficult. But one of the things that turned the tide for us in our ability to manage the pandemic uh, was rapid testing. And uh, that's what allowed us to move the patients around to the right uh, uh, facility, to the right uh, mode of care much faster and allow, for example, those folks with heart attacks coming through to get the right care faster because we knew they weren't COVID, they were heart attacks, right? So the saliva test that was the first on the scene was developed at Rutgers. And the clinical trials were facilitated by the relationship with Barnabas Health. So that's a real life example of only about, what, two years ago, less than that, a year and a half ago, uh, that really highlighted the level of collaboration that we can look forward to. So I'm, I'm hearing more and more the awareness of health as being part of it. So Anthony, as we go into buildings now, people are already at the point where they, they go to their home, they go to work, they go to the store. Building systems, building tech, uh, in, in terms of air, door, air quality and whatnot. What do you see in the future happening? How are people gonna be aware of it? How can they control it from your point of view and what are they looking for? So I think more thoughtfulness in terms of our designing of these facilities is so critical. Um, collaboration spaces that we're seeing within laboratory f facilities are so important for people to actually come together and talk about those ideas. So when we're looking at these type of spaces, how do we manipulate the systems around them to have the best indoor air quality, the best health and wellness aspects? You know, when we look at buildings, the greatest asset isn't that nice TV down here or the light fixtures, that, the beautiful light fixtures up here. It's the people with inside of it. So we need to enable those people inside those buildings to really create the best environment for them. And so what we're seeing now is a move towards more air quality, more fresh air in buildings. And we're taking a little bit of nature and pulling it with inside buildings. But we can't forget about the negative impacts we could have by pulling too much of that inside a building. And we have to be cognizant of the environment that we're implementing these buildings in. So really there's three kind of major pillars that we're seeing on every kind of design going forward right now. Health and wellness, we talked about today, plenty. Energy reduction and carbon emissions, such a critical piece to our building design moving forward to make sure that we're not affecting our planet to any adverse effects. And of course, what Honoria has talked about, which is smart buildings. So these three pillars have to come together to make this beautiful site, and that's what we're looking to do at the Cove. Yeah, and Honorius, I'm also very interested in the sort of live work potential here for hybrid. You know, I think everybody is discussing it. No one's made any conclusions yet. But a 15-minute walk-in city does offer the ideas that uh, you can get to your lab in your home in the same day, maybe several times. That's the potential now. But also, collaborating with other people. You want to be in safe environments. You not you have not just a building here. You have a development, and you also have a community which includes SciTech City or the happening with Liberty, as well as the Mothership of Wellness, St. Barnabas. What do you see? Um, <clears throat> absolutely. So I think, as I, as I mentioned, you know, uh, we see a complete change into how we operate into our small communities right now. Um, having access to, um, to um, technology and having access, access to high-speed information uh, transmission platforms, I think it is key. Uh, being able to uh, uh, truly access the information wherever you are, uh, live, play, or work, uh, will uh, generate uh, uh, interest and will generate, uh, uh, will start, let people start thinking about innovation. So let me just ask, I'm so curious, are, do you see screens throughout with Absolutely. menus about choices that one can make or is it all going to be personalized? Are you aware of the community through? Absolutely. So I think Beyond your, your smartphone and your screen and your smartwatch. Absolutely. So we see screens, there's many screens that you need to take advantage uh, from uh, walking through a community. Uh, we have screens everywhere. Uh, uh, through the use of technology, you can pinpoint a location, uh, and all of a sudden you can make an experience personal, right? So approaching a screen, that screen can become whatever you need it to be. It could, it could be a, a means of uh, collaborating with people, or it could be a means of education. So I can see um, uh, families walking with, with uh, uh, their kids and approaching a screen. The information is there, and you can pull the information, and all of a sudden you can look at the uh, green elements of, uh, of a new development, how well we're doing with uh, uh, our health and wellness goals. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, a walk in a park becomes an education um, 
opportunity and also inspires, you know, uh, uh, pride in to, live, uh, uh, to be able to live in, in a community like this. You know, um, we, we do a lot of work in China, and they're obviously getting into more personalized information. Anthony Aranias, you know, the, the whole idea of the, I call it the clear, right, where you go in and you push, put your eyes in there and it knows your identity and everything about you maybe someday, which is going to go through some things that Stefan's going to talk about. But, you know, where are we with that, for instance? The, you know, understanding visual connections and personal choices made ahead of time or by pattern? Um, I think um, I think we uh, there's a lot of changes into the technology right now. So, uh, can you repeat the question? Well, it's about that. You know, I'm curious. You, you sponsored you a question at a spontaneous one, so I apologize. But you know, really, more and more of the work in uh, certain areas are through the ability to identify you through various either through patterns, visually, through eye technology in terms of you know understanding. Your, your, your um, identity through your eyes. So that will more and more personalize what the potential Absolutely. is for smart technology, and then Anthony Absolutely. can finish up on that one. Absolutely. So I think it's not just that there's many ways to identify and put an ident uh, identity on a person. So the, the, the first element that you have to look at, is it safe, and can I protect your identity? I want to understand who you are. Uh, to be able to offer services to you, but at the same time, I don't want to be intrusive, right? right. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a digital signature uh, through every single day as you walk through your environment, you leave behind the digital signature. That could be a visual element. Cameras have the opportunity to actually pinpoint exactly who you are, looking at uh, your eyes, looking at your uh, face uh, through the facial recognition elements that we have built in. But at the, at the same time, all the devices that we have have a digital signature, which is for sure you know, uh, tied to your persona. Um, we do have a social security, but you have a phone number that probably you will have all your life. So I think that is an exact pinpoint to where you are at any time. Uh, you can right. mask identities and you can deliver services. Curious. So personalized services, I think it's, it's the way to go. Uh, I want to deliver to you what you want to hear. Uh, and what you're interested in uh, versus just general information. So Anthony, we have time for two questions. Building on that in terms of smart technology, what do you think that people are going to be able to call, or what individual calls do you imagine um, people are going to be able to make in building systems? By that I mean anywhere from now um, you know, building uh, comfort levels to uh, your ability to get through a building and, and, and also understand the safety of it as you move through the building? You know, buildings inherently for the past few decades have lacked that interactiveness for the user. You know, of course, the operators in buildings have that access to building systems, understanding outside air levels coming to the building. But we have all missed that kind of component. Yes, we can come into a space. We have our thermostat. We turn on the lights. We have our PC in front of us. But what we're missing is this connection with this device and understanding maybe how many people are on the floor and within a space. Maybe I want to be able to control my air diffuser right at my desk with this device because I'm a little too cold. I need less air. Yeah. So we're going to see more of this get integrated with our everyday life. We're already seeing it in the personal life. We now need to take it to the commercial side more. So being in charge of wellness is the, and being in charge of the environment and having access to it and making personal choices. So Stefan, you're going to, you started, you're going to finish. <laughs> what regulations and how can government agencies or developers that are um, part of a large-scale develop or leading a large-scale development like this, what regulations have to change, and what do you see the infrastructure of just government and building codes and all of that business having to change? Well, so regulations are our friend, but they are generally reactive to to situations that we encounter and don't want to repeat. Um, I was thinking about this issue on my ride home yesterday through Riverside Park. I, I noticed an elderly gentleman. He may have been a widower. He had placed himself near a two pathways in Riverside Park and had placed three um, sort of uh, branches around himself. And I recognized it. I might have said pre-pandemic, this guy's a little kooky. But as I looked more closely, I realized that he was perhaps reenacting our species' first ever act of wellness in creating space for himself in relation to others. 
Um, and I think that that also became sort of the foundation of what became the healing arts, architecture, medicine, planning, and, and uh, innovation. Uh, I think it was visionary. I think it was um, technological. Um, and I think it ultimately also became the foundation to regulations. So regulations have to allow choice, and that's what we're talking about here today. It has to allow a sort of interchange between options and our preferences and perhaps even some coaching that might be going on, uh, again, in service of health and, and, the, and, the, and the commons, and a healthy commons. And I think that's where, what we're all in this room about, and our kookiness, I think, is necessary to demonstrate what it looks like when it's working, and regulation will follow. I think that these types of projects sort of are the tip of the spear for what can become regulatory and scalable. Well, information has always been power, and now we know information is wellness. Yes. Anyway, I'm going to invite everyone to lunch. Um, and you can come up to these nice people and ask them questions, because I know we're on a time limit today. So we're going to move on to lunch. And the, the uh, questions can be done personally and as we all have lunch. Thank you. Thank you.